Well, a few things I would like to address. Firstly, after the Toku had given you the empowerment, uh, he then asked me to extend his request to all of you. The first one is to keep the Samaya vow. So the five vows included in the Great Illusory Net also, he requested that all of you who received the empowerment and need to complete the Nundru practice for those of you who had uh, uh, not completed it. These are the two things that he requested, because time could pass by so fast. Though we made the promise in front of Toku, telling him that over here we place great importance on the study uh, primarily, and uh, Toku then said that despite all of that stress of study, it is necessary for all of you who receive empowerments to then complete the Nundro within three years, otherwise you are not permitted to receive any teachings or empowerments from him. After I've given the teachings on the six bardos, at the time when I gave that teaching, I requested all of you who attend that class to complete your Nodra practice within five years. But now it seems that there are people who haven't completed the Nodra even after seven or eight years. So I think with this kinds of uh, pressure, uh, you need to complete your Nodra. And there weren't many of you who didn't complete it. So we'll see how you can arrange your time appropriately so that you can complete your Nundra practice. Also, I went to the meeting uh, hosted by the Lama Sindromo's uh, management team. And then they also are quite determined to make sure everyone completes the uh, Nundra within three years. Well, if you were to calculate, for example, on prostration, if you can prostrate 100 times, then within three years, you would definitely be able to complete the prostrations. And then I think for many of us here, People tend to get influenced by the stress of study, by the, uh, their mood, by their health, and so on. For people who are quite lazy, I think it is a big stress at the back of your head. But uh, I think it's necessary because otherwise time could pass by really fast and you will not be able to complete your nundra. If you do not practice nundra throughout your whole life, and if you were to make promises, especially to the lamas and your gurus, I think it would be hard to say if the empowerments would be truly beneficial to you. There are some of our fellow staff members and uh, people who are very diligent in study but have no intention to complete the Nundro. I think this is really inappropriate. So for those of you who attended the uh, empowerments, you need to come up with a plan, a schedule, so that you will definitely be able to complete it within three years. And for the Kimbos and Kimbos, I think it's necessary for you to get to know your um, fellow students and uh, do not just only hold on to the grades and marks they get through exams. You need to really get to know them and uh, help them out. Also in terms of Samaya, before the winter retreats, that we would engage in the 14 Samaya vows will be taught by all the classes. The content of the teaching will be made into pamphlets uh, by the Lamas and Jumos. And I hope that the Han practitioners could also then prepare for those kinds of information. For example, there are 
information uh, on the Samaya, the teachings of Samaya in the Great Illusory Net, and uh, so on. So you can get those kinds of texts, uh, get those information on Samaya. Now, before the retreat, the Kampus and Kampus should make an introduction and give teachings on the Samaya. Last year, Toku also taught on the five root vows within the Great Illusory Net, but this is not sufficient. After you have already received the empowerment, it is necessary for you to study the Samaya vows extensively. There are people who had uh, received the empowerments but are not keeping their Samaya vows, then that would be leading to very dangerous consequences. So I hope all of you can place great importance on this uh, subject. This year, initially, I wanted to give the Vajrayana teaching on the topic of entering the way of uh, Mayana. And uh, for those of you who had already studied it, you should understand that this is not sufficient for you to only study it once. After studying the Great Illusory Net for a few times over here, you can see how important it is to uh, build a firm and, uh, and uh, uh, solid foundation for your further studies. Last year, it seems that the time was not enough or to simply study that text for one time is not enough. That is why this time the Kampus and Kampus will further give, study, give the teaching on the entering the way of uh, uh, Mahayana. Now that you have already received so many empowerments, this is exactly the time that you should receive this teaching. If you can come to a uh, good understanding of uh, entering the way of uh, Mahayana, you will be able to uh, clear lots of your doubts and questions. Now let's continue with our class on the Shurangama Sutra. Let us now continue our class on the Shurangama Sutra, and, and currently we are making analysis of the seven great elements, which includes the um, elements of the earth, water, fire, wind, space, and then the consciousness and view. Within which we have already covered on the, the earth element, the fire element, the water element, and today we are going to make the analysis of the wind element as well as the space element. Let's continue to look at the actual text, the sutra. The Buddha then told Ananda, saying that Ananda, by nature, the wind has no substance. Each of the elements, we need to make the analysis of its nature. Either the nature is uh, certain or not certain. What is the nature of the wind then? In fact, it is without substance. It is not solidly, solidly existent, just like the previous elements. The nature of the wind is, in fact, of constant movement and stillness, and it is impermanent. We know how wind works. It is all of a sudden there's wind, and then um, even during the uh, gracely wind, the, there could be peacefulness that comes from nowhere. So that is the nature of wind. There is no substance to it. There is no constant nature to it. 
it is of movement and stillness, uh, but such movement and stillness are impermanent. And then the Buddha continued to give Ananda examples to demonstrate what the nature of wind is. After studying Shurangama Sutra, I think we would be able to understand more of the uh, logical analysis uh, from the Buddhist logic. On top of that, the Buddha made different angles of observation of the twelve ayatanas and six entrances and the five aggregates, and each of them are described and analyzed from different angles. Previously, after we studied the medium Agama Sutra and the uh, miscellaneous Agama Sutra, or including the Prajna Paramita Sutra, Usually, the analysis are very similar to one another. And then later on, after one specific analysis, the next ones would say that so that analysis or that logic would apply to the form, sound, smell, touch, and so on. But it seems that Shurangama Sutra is very different. Shurangama Sutra analyze each of the questions from a very different angle. Over here, the Buddha gives an example to another, saying that you always adjust your robe as you enter the Great Assembly. When the corner of your saga, samgati brushes the person next to you, there is a slight breeze which stirs against that person's face. Ananda, whenever he enters into the Sangha, he would adjust his uh, attire. I think it applies to us as well. Whenever we attend any Dharma assembly or whenever we go to the shrine hall to listen to class, we need to straight up our clothes so that we would look proper in our robes. And then, in such a way, people will not generate wrong views or slander you. The worldly people are also like such. They would dress appropriate attire to different situations, and they would straighten up their clothing before entering into a large assembly. I think majority of our sangha here, the monastics, are doing much better than years ago. The lay practitioners should dress like a lay practitioner. Previously, I've addressed that there are a few numbers of our lay practitioners where their hair too short. And in such a way, you don't look like a lay practitioner nor a monastic because the clothing that you wear is not monastic, but the hair is just too short. Over here, Ananda, when he enters into assembly, he simply would adjust these uh, robes. And Samgati over here uh, means it's the general name for Kashaya, the monastic robe. In fact, there are a few different types, the ones with three pieces, with five pieces, and with seven pieces. The clothing, the robes of the Buddha, we would call them as Kashaya. Before the Buddha made the Vinaya and precepts for people to dress Kashayas in certain ways, uh, in fact, there were no rules for what monastics should wear. But maybe because the uh, winter time in India is still a bit cold and then the big shoes would stay um, at at certain of the donors' places, and then they would wear different kinds of clothing at different places, and then the Buddha felt that um, those types of uh, uh, dresses doesn't look very dignified. Therefore, he made the um, particular types of uh, clothes that the monastics should wear. But at that time, according to Vinaya, in fact, there is no description of the monastic scarf. Rather, 
only the different types of monastic robes. Anyhow, over here, the Buddha said that, Ananda, when you are about to enter into the great assembly, and at the time of adjusting your robe, the corner of your samgati may touch other people's face or touch other people. At that time, is it because of the movement of your clothes? Because the, the movement of your clothes, then a breeze would swift over other people's face. So the breeze that's brought forth by the movement of the, the clothing. Now, this breeze, where does it come from? Does this wind come from the corner of the kashaya, or does it arise from emptiness, or is it produced from the face of the person brushed by the wind? Where does it come from? And then the Buddha would continue to analyze. Uh, the three aspects. It seems that in each of the elements there are the three aspects, but the angles are very different. Now, Ananda, if the wind comes from the corner of the kashaya, you are then clad in the wind, and your kashaya should fly about and leave your body. Since there's wind, since the wind comes from the corner of your kashaya, then you're not wearing a robe, you're wearing wind. Because if wind comes from kashaya, you are simply wearing the wind instead of clothing. Once you wear a wind, your clothes would naturally be blown away or be, uh, be moved away or be blown away. So you will, you will not able to wear clothes on your body since you're wearing wind, which would blow away whatever clothing you would put on your body. In this way, Ananda, you are really not wearing any clothing since you are wearing wind and wind would blow away your clothes therefore you are not wearing clothes but that is definitely false it is not like such at all and then the Buddha continued to say that I am not speaking Dharma in the midst of the assembly and my robe remains motionless and hands straight down. Ananda, you should look closely at my robe to see whether there's any wind in it. Ananda said that I'm giving you Dharma teachings among this large assembly, so everyone, you should look at my clothing right now, and Ananda, especially you, look at my clothing. Is there wind? I'm wearing wind or am I wearing monastic robe? I definitely am wearing clothes, right? You should look closely at my robe to see whether there is any wind in it. Am I hiding some wind inside my robe? So that if I were to let loose of my robe or lift up my robe, the wind would blow to other people's face. Is that the case? Since the, since the uh, kashaya is not wind, how could it bring wind? It cannot be that wind. It, it cannot be that the wind is stored somewhere in the robe either. So it is neither from kashaya. The wind is neither come. The wind neither comes from kashaya nor stored and hidden somewhere in the kashaya either. 
Then the third aspect, if it arose from emptiness, from the space, this is the third aspect, right? Why wouldn't the wind brush against the man even when your robe didn't move? If the wind were to be generated and arose from space at the time of your clothing not moving, then the person who is still staying in space, why doesn't the wind blow to that person's face? Because previously, you simply um, you simply moved your the corner of your clothing, which created a little breeze. We feel that often. But if this breeze were to come from space, then when your clothing is not moving, there should still be wind blowing to that person's face. But why doesn't it? Therefore, that is incorrect. In the sutra, it says that emptiness is constant in nature, since it is unconditioned, thus the wind should constantly arise as well. Since you were to say that the if you think that the wind arises from emptiness, then since the space is constant in nature, the wind should also be constantly arise, constantly uh, be there. To give you an example, in our shrine hall, since it is filled with the space, let us be here or not be here, there would be a constant wind going on in our shrine hall. It doesn't matter if we have clothing or not clothing, with the windows open or without the windows open, it doesn't matter, because as long as there is space, there should be uh, there should be wind, according to whatever you uh, according to what you said. Also, since you said at the time of without wind, then the space should also disappear. It should also cease, since you said that the emptiness is constant in nature, and then the wind arises from space. One, one stays, therefore the other one would also arise. That's their relationship. It is just to say that if the father exists, then the son would also. But if the father doesn't exist, how could the son exist? Similarly, over here it says that you can perceive the disappearance of the wind. This is possible. We often would say that the wind is quiet and the waves are gone. So we say that. But what would the disappearance of emptiness look like? There would, no, there would be no way of perceive the uh, disappearance of space. That would be very difficult to explain. If it did arise and disappear, it could not be what is called emptiness. Since it is what is called emptiness, how can it generate wind? If emptiness would disappear, then how could it be space anymore, because space is constant? Since space is empty, it is emptiness, it is space, that's the nature of it, that's the characteristic of it. Then out of this emptiness, how could there be wind? How can it generate wind? So there is no way to have any evidence to prove it. And then the third one says that if the wind were to come from the face of that person, if the wind came from the face of the person by your side, that is not reasonable at all. How could it be? It would blow up on you while you set your robe in order. Why would it blow backwards up on the person from whom it was generated? 
the wind, the, the direction of the wind would be blowing from that person's face to Ananda rather than from uh, Ananda's robe to that person's face. It seems that the Tathagata would be able to explain from explain one thing from many different angles, even if it's something that's very simple. So his way of explaining things are definitely very subtle and profound. So previously was the problem that's associated associated with the wind coming from the face of the other person. And then, upon closer examination, you will find that the robe is set in order by yourself. The face blown by wind belongs to the person by your side. And the emptiness is tranquil and uh, not involved in movement. So when you were tidying up and, and uh, straightening up your clothing, the, why would the wind of the other person blow onto your face? That doesn't make any sense. Because, uh, first of all, it was you who were straightening up your clothing, and second of all, if the wind were to come from his face, then the wind would be blowing towards your direction instead of blowing towards himself. That is not reasonable either. The direction would be incorrect. That's definitely wrong. Making observation from such a way, we would feel that we really don't usually analyze the wind. Sometimes we feel that, oh, this is the wind that's coming towards me, uh, such as whenever we open up the window or whenever other people straightening up, straightening up their clothing, there would be wind or breeze that's blown onto your body. Uh, but we had never really made the ob observation in such a way to examine where the wind comes from. And then the Buddha continued to say that, make a closer examination. You will find the robe is set in order by itself. The face is blown by the wind belongs to the person by your side, and the emptiness is tranquil and not involved in movement. These are the three aspects that you need to make the observation. So the first aspect, is that the wind blow onto others' face, and the face is the others, and the wind is tranquil. The, the, empty, the emptiness, the space itself is without any movement. The space is tranquil and uh, is not involved with movement. So from the three aspects, your clothing, other people's face, and the space, you cannot mix and unite them together. In this way, where then does the wind come from that blow in this place? If we were to make observation following the method that the Buddha taught us, following the wisdom of the Buddha, you will notice that many things in this world are like such. All phenomena in this world can be observed in such a way. In the Sutra, it says that wind and emptiness cannot mix and unite since they are different from each other. They are different entities. The nature of the two, the wind and emptiness, are different. If they are completely different in its nature and entity, then how could they mix and unite? Previously, Ananda asked, well, uh, isn't everything produced from the, con uh, the uniting and mixing of causes and conditions? So over here, the Buddha said that, well, since the wind and emptiness cannot be mixed and united because they are different from each other, they're different entities and different have different na natures. We could say that the causes and, connect and the conditions could make production. However, even if we're not talking about the other five great elements, even if we're just looking at the element of space and then the element of wind, they're completely 
completely different because one is with moving, movement and the other one is without movement. One is with production and cessation and the other one is without production and cessation. How could these two, which are completely different entities and different, uh, different things to be mixed and united? Usually we can say in a conventional way that everything is uh, everything arises from causes and conditions, but the Buddha over here in this sutra specifically talked about the phenomena is not a reason because of causes and conditions and not from spontaneity either. And uh, that statement is from a deep uh, examination. It is a simply just a dreamlike conditions and causes that's maturing, which makes such kind of uh, dreamlike production as well. But when you truly to make the observation, there is no production. And then in the sutra, the Buddha continued to say that you still do not know that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of wind is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true wind, pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It seems that Ananda is getting more and more confused at this point. <laughs> It seems that I shouldn't bad more bad mouth Ananda. The Buddha said that, well, you still do not know that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of wind is true emptiness. The wind is indeed uh, the true emptiness, and then the true the nature of emptiness is true wind, pure at its origin. It is with the nature of emptiness and the nature of luminosity, and it pervades all of the Dharma Dhatu. This particular teaching, is it well understood by the sentient beings of the ten, uh, of the ten Dharma Datus? Um, on top of the six realms of beings, so there is also the Shravakas, Pratika Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, and the Buddhas all together. That's the ten, um, ten sentient beings, ten types of sentient beings of Dharma Datu. The different kinds of wind based on the different karma and different mind of the sentient beings would be completely different. The wind to the shravakas and wind to the bodhisattvas, wind to the mundane beings and wind to the beings of the six realms would be completely different. Uh, when we are enjoying some nice breeze, uh, our experience could be different if we have good practice at that moment, good insight we would feel that this particular breeze is very comfortable. It must be the blessings from the three jewels. When we do not have a good mood at that moment of uh, um, having the wind blown through us uh, or uh, blown around us, we would feel that, oh, it's uh, it's a terrible wind and it's horrible, or the wind to the Ashuras and to the Hell Realm beings are completely different. That is because it accords with the living beings' minds in response to their capacity to know. To continue in the Sutra, Ananda, in the same way that you, as one person, move your robe slightly. Just because you slightly moved your robe, Ananda, and then there's a small wind arises. After that wind arises, this wind inside, in fact, has already arise in all countries if there is a similar movement throughout the Dharma realm. This wind is all pervasive throughout the Dharma Dhatu and all the countries. If we were to also use this robe and uh, um, make a slight movement, it could also make the person beside you to feel this uh, small breeze as well. Wherever and whomsoever moves your clothing like this, then you would definitely be able to create a small wind. In Asia, uh, in Africa, in whichever place you are in the world, 
you would be able to create a small wind in this way. So what does it mean? It means that it can produce, uh, this wind can be produced throughout the world since it is within the nature of the uh, Buddha nature. Since Buddha nature has already contained this four great elements nature, and it is all pervasive throughout the Dharma Dhatu. Since it can be produced throughout the world, how can there be any fixed place to which it is confined? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. Indeed, it is because of our very different karma we would be able to see the different wind. Um, according to some of the commentary, it says that out of all the powers, the power of wind is the greatest. Indeed, the wind carries a great role in our animate and inanimate world. Without wind, then there would be no movement, no movement of thoughts, no movement of our physical body. We do need wind. Our eye, ear, nose, tongue, body also needs wind, um, relies on the wind to have movements. Also in the world, let it be the difference of the seasons changes or the differences of the different beings in different realms, all the way between hell realm to the pure world, to the pure land, Sukhavati or Shambhala, wind is something that we cannot uh, live without. Wind is so important to us. In summer, we don't have too, uh, we don't have ghastly wind, but we have lots of wind in winter. I heard today there was a tornado in Zhejiang or some area around the southern part of China, about thousands of people uh, were attacked by this tornado. There was a, quite a catastrophe. Indeed, wind sometimes could bring about happiness, especially the cool breeze in summer, or sometimes would bring about great suffering. I remember that back in 2008, I was in Hong Kong at the time when Typhoon Mankut hit Hong Kong. There was a catastrophic damage made by the typhoon. The windows of all the high-risers, many of them were um, completely broken because of the hit of the typhoon. At the time when Typhoon Man could hit Hong Kong, I was riding in a car on the highway and uh, I was quite afraid that the car would be blown to the bottom of the, um, the highway by the typhoon because there were lots of shakes and moves. But the driver said, oh, don't worry, it's fine. So we can see that wind indeed sometimes could bring about a catastrophe and sometimes could bring about bliss. In our world, without wind, and in our body, if we don't have wind, our body would rotten, and in our world, without wind, um, our world would also be damaged. So we know that the, the power of wind is great, and it is all pervasive. It is just that we do not recognize it. The Buddha said that ignorant of this fact, the people in the world are so deluded as to assign their origin to cause and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes which arise from the discriminations and reasoning process of the conscious mind are nothing but the play of empty words which bear no real meaning. The nature of wind, in fact, is the treasury of the thus come one. The nature of it, the nature of wind is empty. 
We need to know that the true nature of wind is emptiness, and the true emptiness is the true wind. This is quite an important one to remember. Another one is that um, it accords with the living beings' minds in response to their capacity to know. This is another really important verse. Another one is that it is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. So these three are extremely important. If we can't memorize all the teachings in the Shrangama Sutra, at least we should be able to memorize some, some parts of it or some very short stanzas in which that could bring us a great um, insights. I remember that when I was when I was little and when I was still herding yaks, I would herd the yaks in wind at all times, and sometimes I feel that it would be the best to have a place to um, hide from the wind. Eventually I found a refuge in uh, to refuge in a small cave. It was a very little cave. When I came out from that cave, there were some people around there, and uh, because I was really little when I uh, was at that age, um, there, since there were a few of the adults standing outside and saw me coming out from a tiny cave, and uh, he said that, is it a person or is that a rabbit? And then in the next part in the sutra, it says that Ananda, the nature of emptiness has no shape. We can also make analysis of emptiness, of space. In fact, emptiness doesn't have any form. It is the um, emptiness is only apparent because of form. It is to say, if, for example, you have a container that it takes the shape of a square, of a a box, and then within that we can say that the space is of the shape of a box. If our house is of a sphere, then we could describe the space as a spherical as well. So the space can only be descri described or it is only apparent because of form. And then the Buddha continued to tell such an example. For instance, Shravasti is far from the river, so when the Kshatriyas, Brahmins, Vaishyas, Shudras, Pradvajas, Chandalas, and so forth built their home there, they dig wells seeking water. In the city, Shravasti, since there are places that's still far from the river, so when there are the kshatriyas, so the, the kings, and then the Brahmins, the priests, the priests, according to the caste system, they are of the most noble ones, because it is said that they were born from the mouth of the Brahma, therefore they they say that they are the uh, descendants of the Brahma. Therefore, they're considered as the most noble. And then Vaishyas, we also talked about that as well. The Vaishyas are the merchants. We talked about that in the uh, Wish Fulfilling Treasury. Also, Shudras. Shudras, according to the commentary of the fingers and palms, it says that they are the farmers, and then Bharadvajas, the technicians, or the craftsmen, also Chandalas, the lowest of the 
cast. Usually, the ones who takes the job of killing the other beings, the other sentient beings, and they would feel that by taking up the vicious these activities could dignify themselves, such as killing, killing animals, or even killing people. Chandalas are usually not very much respected in India. Also, one of the signs they have is to hold a bell, and sometimes uh, whenever they walk by, there are sounds of the bell. Also, um, if they do not have any bells. They would hold some bamboos or some uh, sticks to make some sounds while they walk. Therefore, when the Chandalas are walking by, the other noble, uh, pe the other people, the other noble, noble people, do not want to get close to them or touch them at all. So over here, the example is that in the city Shravasti, which is far away from the riverbank, for that reason, this group of people who lives in who live in the city Shravasti would start to make a well. While building it, where a foot of earth is removed, there is a foot of emptiness. Since the different people from different castes are uh, digging to make a well, to build a well, they would be keep, they would uh, keep digging so that the well would be built. Unlike nowadays, we have machines that does this kind of work. Over here, the example is that while they're digging the well, a foot of earth is removed from the earth where then a foot of emptiness would be there in the well. Now, one foot is about 33 centimeters and 10 feet is about 3 meters. Kempo over here uses a different measuring system. That's a Chinese measurement, which is slightly longer than 10 feet. It's about 3.33 centimeter uh, meters. You're very good at math. Since one <laughs> foot is about 3.33 centimeters, <laughs> so you're good at getting the result of 3.33 meters. Let's look at the sutra over here, where um, a foot of earth is removed, there is a foot of emptiness. Where as many as 10 feet of earth are removed, there are 10 feet of emptiness. The more you, the more earth you uh, dig out from the well, then the more space. This really reminded me of groundhogs that we have in Serta. All the groundhogs work very hard in digging. Holes. Other than groundhog, there are small birds actually uh, would also dig holes and live in, in the ground as well. At the beginning of the institute, since we didn't have lots of provisions, so we didn't have enough infrastructures to use and didn't have enough place to live, so there were uh, practitioners who would just make a cave inside the ground to live. 
无印而就无印而。And then the Buddha posed the question: the depth of emptiness corresponds to the amount of earth removed. So here's the question: Does this emptiness come out of the dirt? Does it exist because of the digging, or does it arise of itself without a cause? After digging out those earth in the past, it was by、um, the man force, but now it's by machines. So, Ananda, does this emptiness come out of the dirt, or because of the action of digging, or does it arise of itself without a cause? These are the three questions. Moreover, Ananda, suppose this emptiness arose of itself without any cause. Then, what's the point of digging, or what's the point of removing this earth at all, since it is since emptiness arose of itself without any cause? Why wasn't it unobstructed before the earth was dug? Why wasn't it unobstructed? How could the space be obstructed or、uh, were unseen at that time? How would you be able to see the space after you finish digging out the earth? The earth. If it arose from of itself without any cause, then how could you not be able to see it earlier? Let it be one foot or ten feet. Nobody saw that. Quite the contrary, one saw only the great earth at that time. There was no emptiness evident in it before digging. It is only. During the time of digging, we saw、uh, the space. If emptiness came about because of the removal of earth, we should have seen it entering the well as the earth was removed. By the time we take the earth out, we should be able to see how the、uh, space would be poured into that、uh, that. Part of uh, the um, the well, just like when after class a group of people would then. Get out of the shrine hall. According to the commentary, it says that the space must have a character, must have a form,、uh, in such a way it could be able to enter. Otherwise, if there's a space, how would you be able to see that how it enters? Now, after you finish digging the earth out, and the space. Should have a character. Then the character, the、uh, space that has this kind of form, should be able to enter into it. If there is no going in or coming out, then there is no difference between the earth and emptiness. Why then does an emptiness come out of the well along with the earth in the process of digging? If there is no coming in or out of the space, then there is no difference between the earth and emptiness. What's the difference of them? Since you said that it at first you said that、um, it came from the earth, but you do not see the space entering back, then you are saying that the earth and the emptiness are the same. If you are to say that they are the same, then you are saying that they are no difference. They are of the same entity. The emptiness is the earth. Why then does an emptiness come out of the well along with the earth in the process of digging? Well, in this way, if you're saying that the earth and the emptiness are the same, then、um, the after you're digging out the the earth, the space should also be dug out. Isn't that interesting? Isn't this particular way of analysis interesting? I think sometimes we can also use this the way of debating as well. Sometimes I notice the 
uh, Sangha member over here do not follow the methods of observation, rather use your own imagination. Some of the imagination can be creative and some are not. Are not quite reasonable. This is the second observation. Now, the third one if emptiness appeared because of digging, if you were to say that it's because of the process of digging, because of such emptiness appeared, then you're saying that instead of digging out of uh, earth, you're digging out of. Uh, emptiness, then the digging would bring out emptiness instead of earth. If emptiness does not come out because of digging, then the digging yields only earth. Why then do we see emptiness appear as the well is dug? If you were to say that uh, I am simply digging out of earth, but then how would you be able to see in this well, you can already see this one foot of uh, um, hollowed in hole in the ground. You can still see space over there. If you were to say that, oh no, I, I was simply digging out of earth, then um, why do we see emptiness appear as the well? Stuck. I think it's a little bit difficult for those of you who never studied uh, Buddhist logic, but if you can open up your mind, then you would be able to understand. Uh, the Buddha said that you should consider this even more carefully. The Buddha said that you will think even more carefully, look into it deeply, and you will find the digging comes from the person's hand as its means of convenience. And the earth exists because of a change in the ground. But what causes the emptiness to appear? In fact, the digging comes from our hands or the, the man's hands when he's digging. And then there's the convenience, the uh, change of transportation of those earth, moving those earth from inside the ground to the outside of the ground and move them into some other place. For example, currently we are maintaining the road, we're mending the road, and while we're doing that, uh, we dug out a hole and put a pipe in there. So while the center part is empty, uh, we would move the earth to a different place. Uh, over here, the Buddha said that since it's the man's hands who are holding the tools and digging the earth out of the earth, uh, the earth out of the ground, and then move them to a different place. In such a way, where does the space come from? What causes? and the em what causes the emptiness to appear. Also, the digging and emptiness, one being substantial and the other one insubstantial, the digging is substantial. It has an actual action, but the space is insubstantial. It's just like the child of a barren woman, how could these two be mixed and united? Therefore, they do not mix and unite together. When we say that earth, water, fire, wind, and space, what are the causes and conditions for them? On one hand, we could talk about that from the causes and conditions point of view, but that is when you have not closely examined the nature of such. But after you make the examination, then you will realize that the elements are not truly existent. It is just like when it comes to the space and earth and the space as well as uh, the digging, these two uh, or these four cannot be mixed and united together. These kinds of causes and, con and conditions cannot be mixed and united. They are simply 
They're simply delusion. Uh, they're simply illusory. They're just like a dream and just like an illusion. How could a digging which is substantial be united and makes the two space which is insubstantial? That is why the Buddha said that it is not with the cause and condition and not a uh, uh, arise from spontaneity, nor can it be that a space exists spontaneously without an origin. You cannot say that it is without a cause, because without a cause, no phenomena can be produced. Although the nature of emptiness is completely pervasive, it is basically unmoving. Sometimes it may seem that the space uh, changes from one place to another, sometimes it appears, sometimes it doesn't. But in the nature, it has never moved at all. You should know that it and earth, water, fire, and wind are together called the five elements. Why would we call the space as the uh, element of space? In some commentaries, it is called the great element of space. It's because it is all pervasive and without movement. Its nature uh, and the space itself would be all pervasive without any movement. The other four elements, the earth, water, fire, and wind, do they all have such kind of nature of pervasiveness and unmoving? Yes, they do as well. That is why it is called the five great elements. Their natures are true and perfectly fused, and all are the treasury of the thus come one, fundamentally devoid of production and extinction. In its nature, it is without any production and extinction. The Shrangama Sutra has fused the third turning of the Dharma wheel, second turning of Dharma wheel, and the first turning of Dharma wheel. Um, it talks about the causes and conditions, which is taught in the first turning of Dharma wheel, and it talks about the emptiness, which is taught in the second turning of the Dharma wheel, and then the um, luminosity aspect of the the Buddha nature that's taught in the third turning of the Dharma wheel. And then the Buddha told Ananda, saying that, Ananda, your mind is murky and confused. Ananda, you're so confused that therefore you do not understand and you do not awaken to the fact that the source of the four elements is none other than the treasury of the thus come one. Why do you not take a look at emptiness to see whether it is subject to such relativity as coming and going? Now look at it. Is it coming? Is it going? Is it neither coming nor going? According to the commentary of uh, uh, fingers and palm, it says that if it is with coming and going, without coming and going, uh, with coming and is coming and is going, then it is part of the causes and conditions. If you were to say that the space uh, is part is not part of entering or going then you're saying that it is part of a spontaneity. But the true space, the coming and going, not coming or not going, in fact, it is because you do not know its true nature. You're talking about this because you do not know the true nature. So over here it says that you do not know at all that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of enlightenment is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true enlightenment. The nature of Enlightenment is true emptiness, pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It actually accords with the living being's mind in response to their capacity to know. The space, in fact, is perceivable in this world by all of us. Uh, there are people, by relying on this space, created lots of virtuous deeds, and some created lots of vicious deeds. Some, based on those deeds, brought about a great amount of happiness, and some brought 
forth a great amount of suffering. Some said that it would be good to keep your windows open, to keep the uh, a little bit of uh, space of the window so that you would have some oxygen to come into your room. That would be really healthy. And some said, no, no, you shouldn't keep your window open at night because the wind at night is poisonous. If it enters into your body, you would definitely have uh, uh, you would definitely get a cold. So people would say all kinds of things. Let's look at the space inside the room. Could it bring happiness to some and could it bring suffering to some others? That's very different. And it is basically because um, such kind of happiness and suffering is brought forth, of course, to the living beings' minds and uh, in response to their capacity to know and in their different karma as well. Ananda, if in one place there is a well empty of earth, there will be emptiness filling up that one place. Whatever space that you are looking at right now, uh, let it be a little hotel room or uh, inside your, your own room, this space created your world and is your world at this moment. Um, and the Buddha continued to say that if there are wells empty of earth in the ten directions, there will be emptiness filling them up in the ten directions. Sometimes when I look at the ants and how they are building their nests, I would think that look at how the ants work so hard to build their own um, their own uh, homes and living in a completely different kind of space. That's exactly the same as the space that we live in, the homes that, that we live in. We don't even need to look at all the great teachings of impermanence given by the uh, wonderful masters such as when he talks about impermanence. But our current residence, our homes, and our magnificent shrine hall is just like the nest of the ants. So it is quite impermanent, and therefore we need to rely on this space to create virtuous deeds. At least we're over here studying the great Mahayana teachings. And uh, the Buddha continued to say that uh, since it fills up the ten directions, is there any fixed location in which emptiness is found? When we look at the space, each of us, we have a different space, let it be inside Larangar or not. The space is all pervasive. By relying on the space, can you bring forth happiness or suffering that's completely based on your karma? It's completely up to you. Some would say that if I were to leave Larungar, what should I do? Where can I go? I don't know what to do anymore. In fact, you can live anywhere in the four directions or ten directions. There's space anywhere. As long as we have the uh, virtuous karma, then it should be fine. It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. Ignorant of this fact, people in the world are so deluded as to assign their origin to cause and con to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discrimination and reasoning process of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which bear no real meanings. This time, by making analysis of the great elements, definitely helps us to understand this world, this um, Buddha nature, and understand the how the karma plays the parts in the Buddha nature, the connection of the two. I think it definitely brought forth a different types of understanding. Though it is not a piece of instruction that is the same as the Vajrayana, but the way it is explained could definitely bring forth a great amount of faith and certainty in understanding of the Buddha's teaching. So let's stop here today. <laughs>